Welcome everyone to the OER Dynamic Coalition webinar. This one is a special one. It's during the World Conference on Higher Education and we're focusing on OER policy. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Today we will be looking at, uh, at the OER recommendation and looking at it in terms of policy and guide, policy guidance and incentives as they relate to each of the five areas of the, rec of the recommendation. In this regard, you'll see that there are, um, there is number two is developing supportive policy, but our discussion today goes beyond just that number two, but it looks at how policy and incentives can be done to support the different, the other, all five of these areas of action that's foreseen in the UNESCO OER recommendation. The guiding questions that you see on the screen are the uh, will be the uh, the structure of our discussion. We'll be looking at uh, our four speakers to follow. We'll look at the key elements of open education policies, criteria to con to consider for contextualizing open education policies, and how universal this can be, and enabling open education policies and an open education lens on higher education practices. And then we'll be discussing also best practices. The presenters were very honored today to have very high level presenters today from, uh, from a number of different uh, institutions. We have Dr. Javier Atenas, who's a senior lecturer in learning and teaching enhancement at the University of Suffolk in the United Kingdom. Dr. Masata Nindai, who's a lecturer in computer science and ICT and education at the Virtual University of Senegal. Dr. Catherine Cronin, who's an independent open educator from Ireland, and Dr. Uh, Mr. Neil Butcher, who is uh, joining us from OER Africa Saide. And we will have a short discussion period after. With that, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Javier Tennis. Javier, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Saineb. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, uh, sharing this space with you. Uh, and I'm here to introduce uh, our latest um, co-created publication, Defining and Developing Enabling Open Education Policies in Higher Education. This policy brief aims at supporting the development and uptake of open and digital education policies in the higher education context. We have used an approach and it's the same approach that we promote in, 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 in policy making, which is called co-creation. Um, because we consider that it responds and aligns with the ethos of open education. So this uh, brief uh, directly responds and aims to support not only the implementation of the UNESCO recommendations on OER, but also directly and indirectly support the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Um, our work um, builds up in a strong body of literature and also we have looked at a series of elements and like recommendations, policies and guidelines to provide high, their higher education system a framework in which they can work with their own community and also with an extended community of practitioners, including students, librarians, um, learning designers, academics um, and anyone involved as a community of practice aiming to develop sustainable, effective and enabling policy. Open education policy normally can be understood as written on and written guidance and regulations to foster and developing the implementation of open education practices, which include, of course, the use of open educational resources. And for open education resources, we also, we also consider every element that is openly available, such as open data that can help build critical digital literacies, for example. We consider that one of the core aims of open education policy is to catalyze cultural and organizational change um, in, in the case of uh, higher education, which has to be driven by um, social justice, social inclusion, diversity, and student support. When we look at the um, open education policy ecosystem in general terms, we look at three key elements. We look at uh, collaboration. So how they can, can collaborate to have a policy that is effective for their own learning ecosystem, for their own cultural context. We look at bench learning. We look at 
talking, discussing, and learning from all the institutions, from all the realities, to identify good practices in, in policy making and in, in the deployment and, and uptake of, of open education. But also, we look at engagement, we look at the process and input of the community, the community considered as strategic partner, and that includes the students, using a variety of uh, participatory arenas and also looking um, using an approach that is quite well used in, in open government called co-creation. Uh, we aim to encourage a wide range of stakeholders to become policymakers, and that includes developing capacity and developing skills in policymaking, opening up conversations, and including local, international, uh, and a wide variety of people to enable spaces for the discussion in, in developing open education um, um, and open science, for example, or open knowledge, you know, whether content open knowledge policies in, in the higher education sector. We consider that in the context of open science, open access, open data, open government, open education, in general terms, um, what's called openness policies, they need to create public value, though they need to have a transversal and democratic approach to policy making. Um, policy making in the context of openness cannot be, be a directive, cannot be a mandate just where people have to uh, follow a rule and enact it. It needs to have a discussion, it needs to have participation, because this is a way to prevent the railing and promote um, successful policy implementations and sustainable approaches to, to openness to knowledge in general terms. When we look at the open education policy ecosystem, we look at it from um, European alignment, for example, with strategies. When we talk about strategies, we talk about strategies about education at national, international, uh, and also institutional level. We look at policy alignment, how aligned is the open education uh, policy with the open science, for example, or with the open access approaches? Is there a connection in the uh, knowledge ecosystem of an institution? Uh, we look at the procedures, how are we promoting uh, the enablement or how or, or the deployment of open education practices within an institution. And also we look at supporting resources that, that includes, for example, budget and training uh, to enable open education, and also open science and, and open access. In the context of, of open education, yeah, we, we look at a pyramid, which is basically infrastructure. First, we have the supranational and international recommendations. Ergo, we have the OER recommendation uh, for open education, we have the UNESCO recommendation for open science, the UNESCO recommendation for artificial intelligence, we have all the work the Commonwealth of Learning is doing. So this is a series of guidelines and, and, and declarations, for example. So we, we, we think about Cape Town, we think about Louisiana, we think about uh, Paris, um, that provides a solid ground for countries and for institutions to develop policy in their own context. But then we have to look at the national education strategic priorities in a country when we want to work, not, not just with countries, but with institutions into developing um, open an open education policy infrastructure. Um, and the same applies for open science, for example. But, and, and then we have to look at the institutional priorities and how the priorities have shifted pre and post pandemic um, where, uh, the uptake of digital education, it's been a catalyst to support learners during the last two or two and a half years. So when we talk about enabling policies, we talk about uh, the policy making process, the policy form and style, and the policy content. So we talk about collaboration, we talk about student staff partnership, we talk about widely participation, um, we talk about supporting um, flexible ecosystems to develop um, policy. And we also, uh, we talk about the, the targets and what they are um, alignment with all the policies and, and what's the kind of implementation model. And this is something that I'm, I'm sure Dr. Cronin will, will discuss with us later on. In general terms and in our research, what we have identified, uh, and this is part of the work that I've been doing with Leo Haberman for the last many years, we have identified six key elements that should be included in, in, in policy making, in policies in, in open education. 
and, and, and it's mostly uh, capacity building. So ensure that the people have the training and, and the qualifications to not only develop OER, but also have an open education practices approach to learning and teaching. We've been talking about learning accreditation and then the importance of micro-credentials and the importance of transferring credits obtained through um, open education um, uh, courses, for example. We talk about access and inclusivity. We talk about the importance of including um, uh, the rights of persons with disability as part of the ecosystem of the policy. Open education needs to be inclusive, and that, include, in that includes, for example, using a universal design for learning in the case of open education resources. We consider also that open education should promote a diverse access to knowledge, and that in, um, as open education is about human rights. So promoting and understanding across cultures, um, promoting um, democratic values, equity, social participation, and transparency. Also, we we think about that it's quite, we think it is quite important to have in in the development of open education um, policies, but also in, in for example in the use of open science um, infrastructures. We think about that open education policies should not neglect the importance of. Um, open uh, and digital practices in the context of platform ecosystems. Therefore, they need to have a, they need to have a layer of, of data governance um, to protect the privacy uh, um, in, of learners and educators. And finally, we, we think that policies should promote and catalyze the culture of openness. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important for us that it's not just centered on the resource and use, use and production, but also in, in practices that can promote fair access to democratic education. And that's, for example, means to look into good practices um, from citizen science and open science. We propose a five layer um, policy development um, cycle, which is uh, identify the need for policy, co-create a policy with a group of stakeholders, approve policy, implement it and communicate it, but also keep it system for constantly monitoring and review it. We promote five steps, so you can find all of these and kind of well detailed and uh, well explained in, in our brief. Um, so identify the needs, promote consultation, but not just consultation, also foster collaboration. For participation, we, there are five levels from um, consultation to empowerment. And actually, the steps for co-creation need to start from consulting, consult a consultation with the community, but lead towards empowering the community. So looking at the five levels of public participation is, is really important. Conduct research, conduct analysis, conduct, conduct uh, benchmarking, and also um, it is quite important to keep evaluating and reviewing the process and the resign of the policy. We promote uh, in, in, in general terms, uh, the development of enabling open policies uh, as an opportunity for the organizations and the institutions and the countries to reconnect with, with the needs of the people to, to reconnect with the values and also to um, provide means and arenas for collaboration and networking, uh, embedding elements of thoughtfulness, creativity, collaboration and, and, and leadership as part of the capacity building ecosystem. Here is the link to access the brief. I think I'm just right on time with my 10 minutes. Um, I'm here for any questions and yeah, of course the, um, the brief is, is um, open access. Thank you very much. I will post the um, link now in the chat and, and say it. I don't know if you want to follow up. Eleni? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Javier. Questions will be through the Q&A chat. So we can uh, give the floor to Mashata. Mashata, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for having invited me and uh, for allowing me to present uh, the research findings on OER policy in Sub-Saharan Africa. My name is Ndeye Masata, and I'm a researcher in uh, the field of IT at the Virtual University of Senegal, which provides online education. We have some 50,000 students uh, in Senegal uh, at this digital university. So the results that I will be presenting this afternoon come from a research project with 16 countries that are involved. They come from the French-speaking Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So you have Benin, you have Chad, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Djibouti, Congo, and others. 
And all these countries are French-speaking countries uh, from sub-Saharan Africa. The uh, goal of this research and the expected results are as follows. So first of all, we carried out a uh, summary of the results in the field of OER supportive policy actions at international level. So we decided to uh, have an international benchmark on uh, policy actions at international level. And we decided to sum up the good practices uh, at international level. And the second result, second expected result uh, was a survey a survey on OER support policies uh, in the Educational Resources Project countries, the countries that I just showed you. These are the countries involved in the Educational Resources Project um, by UNESCO. The third expected result is an analysis of OER support policies according to UNESCO's recommendations. Um, the uh, summary that we uh, came up with in the first step about uh, sub-Saharan African countries um, are in line with UNESCO's recommendations and action areas. So this is all based on UNESCO's OER recommendations. And in the last part, which was the main expected result from this uh, research project, was the development of a, a practical guide. And uh, this guide uh, is for the integration of e OER into the policies and strategies of the countries targeted by the Educational Resources Project. So we are currently in a uh, uh, the uh, preparation of the practical guide. The first three steps have already been carried out. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, UNESCO's OER recommendations. So these recommendations have five action areas. First of all, strengthening the capacity of uh, shareholders, stakeholders, sorry, to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER, open educational resources. The second recommendation is about um, the development uh, of policy to support OER. And it's within this framework that the webinar is taking place today. Um, the third action area is about encouraging inclusive and uh, fair quality uh, of OER. The fourth recommendation is about nurturing the creation of sustainable uh, models of uh, OER. And finally, a uh, fifth area is about promoting and strengthening international cooperation uh, on OER. So for those who are joining us uh, now, these are the five action areas stemming from UNESCO's OER recommendations. And this is the cornerstone of uh, the uh, results of the research that I will be presenting to you now. Now, about the preliminary results. I told you that we carried out an international benchmark project. I will not go back to the details of this, but um, it was done by the Commonwealth OER Africa. And I will tell you about what was done in Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. So we have three levels. It's structured around three levels. So we have the interregional level, uh, which um, includes the uh, um, AUF, Agence Universitaire de la Francophonie. And uh, this agency has a digital strategy uh, and it consists uh, in promoting OER. And we implemented the B9 uh, library, which is now indexed. We have some 16,000 uh, resources within this library. Uh, uh, still at interregional level, we also have a uh, skills uh, framework, uh, skills repository, which is being uh, completed by the universities based on a survey. 
that was carried out. And between 2020 and 2021, the uh, Institut de la Francophonie pour l'Education et la Formation, the IFEF, has organized an online course uh, on teaching with OER. And many um, teachers from uh, primary uh, education actually took part um, signed up to this online course. And this is something that was done at interregional level in order to integrate um, OER uh, into existing policies. Now, at national level, I should remind you that the project is about 16 sub-Saharan African countries. And we carried out a survey. Um, and the survey showed us that only Madagascar has a formal strategy on free educational resources. So they had actually devised the strategy before the UNESCO recommendation, and they are working on this. Now, as for other countries involved in the project, uh, they have uh, projects that are being validated, as in Burkina Faso, or they're being currently drafted, like in Niger. In Niger, they're thinking about uh, integrating OER uh, into the policies of uh, the Ministry of National Education. For the other countries, unfortunately, there's no regulatory framework on OER. There are some initiatives, some activities that were uh, implemented within this framework, but that's it. And it's also important to go all the way down to the institutional level to see what has been done. Once again, we have to make a distinction between uh, primary and secondary education. So uh, first level, primary and secondary education. Um, at this level, we saw that uh, uh, with uh, um, distance learning, and remote uh, educational uh, resources. Many countries uh, have uh, developed uh, remote educational resources. So this was done between 2020 and 2021. But unfortunately, based on the results that we observed, these resources uh, are not open. And usually the ministry uh, has used its own funds to develop these resources. And sometimes uh, the source of funding uh, is not clear. Uh, and uh, the developers aren't aware of uh, um, intellectual property rights. And this is an important issue that we will have to uh, take on board uh, when devising um, strategies at institutional or national level. Um, for higher education, um, the situation is similar, especially uh, for virtual universities in the French-speaking Africa. They don't really have a specific policy on OER, but these uh, resources, so OER, can be used as a complementary resource uh, at uh, virtual universities. Uh, and this is the case, for instance, at the Virtual University of Senegal. So these are some of the uh, preliminary results at interregional level, national level, and institutional level. So in general, we can say that most of the countries have not formalized um, the use of OER at a national educational level, but um, work is ongoing thanks to uh, distance learning and uh, remote uh, connections uh, following uh, the pandemic. And um, still in the preliminary resu results, I would like to present um, some information uh, stemming from the survey that we carried out uh, within the 16 countries that I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation. So I will be presenting some guidelines according to uh, the UNESCO recommendation. And the guide that will be uh, uh, provided at the end will be a guide with the aim of guiding all the countries uh, to integrate the recommendations on OER.
and integrating these into their regulatory framework. It's about capacity building for the different stakeholders. We created uh, training resources in French and in the official languages of the countries that I mentioned. Another important point when it comes to capacity building is the a recognition of OER skills in the teaching profession. We have to update the initial teacher training programs, uh, but for those who are already teachers and who will follow classes for further training, there have to be modules uh, which include OER skills that are required by teachers. Uh, current so we need to update initial training programs for teachers and strengthen uh, training of trainers as well in, in uh, science uh, faculties that is to say those who are in charge of uh, uh, these training programs have to make sure that these uh, trainers are, are trained correctly Another important point when it comes to capacity building is uh, the establishment of communities of practices on OERs. Now, once again, according to preliminary results, uh, much needs to be done. In all countries, there are individual initiatives, but it would be useful to create communities of practices, which is important um, in international benchmarking. Another aspect, as you're familiar with, is that in most countries, when it comes to higher education, there are agencies who are in charge of quality assurance. And at the uh, Ministry of Education, there are structures in charge of validating content. So the staff of these agencies or these structures uh, should be trained and uh, uh, should be aware of the use of OER in education. So this uh, concerns the preliminary directive uh, on the first level, the first field. Now, the second one is um, elaboration of um, policies um, uh, for support. Now, uh, my colleague mentioned co-creation policies. Um, so to start with, uh, an inventory has to be drawn up of the regulatory texts. Uh, now, it, this is not restricted to OERs alone. We need to go further than that. Um, uh, these can be regulatory texts uh, for open education, open science, open data, and even digital education, uh, or any other rel re related documents uh, that focus on this theme. The second thing which refers to co-building is the fact that uh, currently in universities and teaching and learning institutions, there are certain policies that are already in place um, and work on resource development. Uh, so we should work with these uh, uh, groups that are already uh, acting consolidate or create a working group of actors if need be involved in the implementation of educational uh, texts, regulatory texts, uh, regulatory plans, um, so that there is a, a continuity uh, and proper implementation of the recommendations. Sometimes ministers have pointed out uh, uh, the um, importance of uh, sectoral policies. Uh, this is a tool that is used by ministries to communicate with the staff in charge of implementing policies at the ministerial level. So we need to see how to integrate OERs in these, um, uh, these ministries in charge of training and education and uh, also we will also uh, share some kits that are being elaborated. Um, now, 
Of course, we need to promote effective and inclusive and mainly equitable access to quality OERs. But for this, we need funding, national funding that are earmarked for education and training. So the idea is to create an impulse fund uh, and for open science and education at the national level and then set up OER platforms online that are multilingual in French and in the official languages of the countries concerned. And also make sure that these platforms are accessible offline, because in a lot of these countries, um, there isn't enough internet access. So this needs to be taken on board and access therefore has to be available offline as well. And this needs to be kept in mind when these platforms are developed. And they also need to be adapted to any type of connection terminal, whether it's a laptop or it's a smartphone or it's a tablet. Then another important aspect uh, when it comes to inclusion uh, is to promote the development of OER that meet the standards of interoperability and of metadata so that these platforms are interoperable and transferable. They need to be transferable because it is also an important feature and also uh, they have to be able to be printed. So the OERs uh, that are put on these platforms are of course multimedia resources but the learners or even the teachers need to be able to print them in areas where internet access does not exist or is very difficult which exists in numerous countries and then uh, we have to encourage public private partnerships for the development of these oers the uh, directives uh, concerning fostering sustainable models is uh, uh, one of the recommendations uh, and this uh, recommendation would, wants to ensure that publicly funded learning materials uh, are used as OERs. Most countries have developed uh, educational resources. Uh, there is no specific information about the licensing policies. Maybe there isn't enough information on copyrights, etc. So there has to be training on this, uh, how to uh, transfer the database of uh, resources that already exist um, into OER. And this requires um, inter-regional discussion for uh, the creation, translation, adaptation, access and funding of OER. and. Uh, this is uh, needed uh, because uh, we have to use the collaborative format for this sort of um, endeavor. And the, me the policies uh, have to make sense. Uh, and in order to do so, teacher and learner involvement is actually very important. We need their buy-in to be able to develop these OER policies. And lastly, uh, these processes need to be monitored and improved on continuously. And uh, therefore, we need to conduct surveys on the implementation of OERs and share the results with all stakeholders. Then the last point is international cooperation. This is the last item in this directive, and the directive has uh, tried to, to focus uh, on uh, developing groups or communities of practices uh, and integrating the country and its communities of practice into regional and international communities as well by using different platforms, OER, OER com Commons Nodes, etc. Not everything exists uh, in Africa, in um, French-speaking Africa, but it is very important uh, to promote uh, international cooperation. And therefore, when these communities of practice are implemented, they need to be integrated at the regional and international levels. And we're now looking at the fourth industrial revolution which is the digital revolution so one has to promote the digital presence uh, 
of these uh, local communities of practices um, so that they are all included in the digital world uh, and partnerships can be envisaged between governments uh, to execute certain initiatives, uh, especially when it comes to research projects, uh, in order to uh, make sure that the investments are profitable. So these are some of the initiatives that I wanted to share with you in the framework of this research project. Just one last piece of information is the creation of a guide, which is like a handbook for the integration of OERs in the policies and strategies of the six countries that I mentioned at the outset. Just one important thing, uh, this kit, as I did in my own presentation, will focus on UNESCO's recommendations. Um, the first part will be dedicated to understanding what OERs are and what UNESCO's OER recommendations are, and then present uh, practical modalities on how to integrate OERs into country policies and strategies through co-creation, either at the international level or at the national level, and also to support the guidelines for each field of action of the recommendations. And so this is what we have in mind, and we hope that um, in a few days we will be able to present the different actors that work in this field. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So the, the floor is to our next speaker, Dr. Cronin. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eleni. I will share my screen. Uh, I just want to say thank you, of course, to uh, the hosts today, to UNESCO for the invitation to join you all today and to my fellow presenters and everyone who's made the time to be here today. I uh, appreciate it. We appreciate it very much. Um, I want to begin simply by acknowledging the exceptionally challenging times each of us is living and working in, uh, which can um, most definitely be described as a time of crisis. Um, and, you know, some of this has been alluded to by the speakers already. Um, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the climate crisis, uh, rising austerity, rising authoritarianism, surveillance capitalism, deepening inequalities, which are, of course, both multiple and intersecting and evolving, ongoing instability, and that is all before we consider the multiple challenges and tensions within higher education itself. So part of the work that I think we're, we're addressing today is, is um, addressing the challenges we face in this increasingly challenging time. Um, the draft recommendation, which has been the, the pillar around this work, which this work has been developed, uh, as has already been mentioned, we're, we are focusing on the second recommendation about developing supportive policy, but they are, of course, integrated. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that the, the draft recommendation, even in its draft form, has enabled so many of us to coordinate our efforts globally. And I think that's already obvious um, today. Uh, in addition, the call for joint action, which was published just over two years ago, um, certainly in my own work was a rallying point um, for um, encouraging consideration and use of OER and open practices. And you know, as was forecast in the call for joint action, um, we've seen that OER have played a crucial role during the pandemic over the last two years when online and digital learning has become the new normal uh, for learning worldwide at all levels. Um, during these two years, of course, we've also seen that educators who've responded to the pandemic and wider crises found that sharing open practices was just as important as sharing open resources. And this only reinforced you know, earlier research, um, which highlighted this importance of focusing broadly, I think, on open educational practices, which are inclusive of, but not limited to OER in seeking to achieve the overall aims of open education, of um, improving access, uh, participation, and equity. So we have taken this approach, this broad approach in the policy brief, which is launched today. Um, and we use the definition of open education policy um, that is open education policy supports decision-making in the area of open education 
um, but they are guidelines that seek to foster the development and implementation of OEP through the creation, um, including the creation rather of OER. So um, today we are a collection of people who are gathered to talk about open education, but in wider work in higher education and online education, I am often asked um, why the focus on policy you know, uh, we understand the focus on awareness raising and infrastructure and so on, but why, why is policy so important? And we, we highlight a great deal of research in the policy brief, but I want to once again um, <clears throat> cite the findings of the very influential Roar for D project, uh, which studied the uptake and impact of OER on education in the global south. Um, and this uh, figure here, which I'll describe, is from a, a chapter in the in the collection of publications of the Roar for D project. This was authored by Patricia Arinto, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams, um, and Henry Trotter. And these authors mapped the factors influencing OER engagement, which you can see over on the left, with levels of social inclusion um, identified in green. So progressing from access to participation to empowerment. So you know, as you look up from the bottom of the list on the left up to the top, you, you see, you know, OER awareness and infrastructure and so on. Um, but if we truly want to realize um, the aims, the ambitious aims of open education, um, we want to reach the higher levels, which are the levels that, that these authors identify as um, both participation and empowerment. And you can see here that institutional policies are indeed essential to this. Okay, I would say that they're really a linchpin in this work and anyone who's worked in open education, open education for some time would realize this. If we aim to meet the highest ideals of using um, and um, using OER, OEP and, and implementing open education at its highest level, enacting supportive open education policies is essential. So what did, what did we learn during the last two years during the global move to online teaching, learning and assessment? We learned many things. Um, but in the area of policy, um, I know that in Ireland and in conversations with colleagues globally, there was a growing realization that the necessary policies um, for teaching, learning, and assessment either did not exist um, or did not sufficiently meet the needs of students and educators and or institutions. Um, so what kind of policies are we talking about? Um, well, certainly, uh, if we're talking about specifically and explicitly open education policies, um, we might be talking about the existence of OER policies, open science policies, intellectual property policies. However, um, anything that is digital, of course, can be open. So many of the issues that arose, particularly in the last two years, related to, uh, in, in the whole domain of digital and online education, related to sharing, privacy, surveillance, and data on the open web. So uh, we suggest that even if our remit is to support the development of open education through policy, the entire digital and online learning and teaching domain should be our terrain. And, and I think this has already been alluded to by the previous speakers. So it's important for us that we engage not with just with those committed already to open education, but to all engaged in digital and online education, which are, are all in education, because um, these issues arise everywhere. Unfortunately, as well, another thing we learned is that the absence of policy speaks very loudly. So if policy supports decision making, um, it also communicates what is allowed, what is accepted, what is encouraged, what is supported, and ultimately what is valued. So an absence of policy is a lack of communication of what is encouraged, supported, and valued, um, and a lack of uh, the opportunity to build collective understanding um, about those things because it is not explicit. And we will never reach you know, our ultimate aim of changing culture um, and, and um, realizing the good that we, that we know is possible um, if we don't address policy um, and create supportive policy. When individuals, uh, just uh, as an aside to this, when individuals share, for example, within, um, a certified system, for example, within higher education, a VLE or an LMS, an individual's identity and role are predetermined and set. But when we share openly um, on the open web and you know, whether that's open scholarship, open educational resources, whatever, this is much more complex. And I, I've described the use of OEP as complex, personal, 
contextual and continually negotiated. So again, this points to the need for open practice, uh, if it is to be encouraged, needs to be um, supported by policy. So the policy brief that's being launched today arose from conversations around this guide, which uh, the guide to developing enabling policies for digital and open teaching and learning, which was published uh, by the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education in Ireland last October. Um, and I worked on this collaborative project with colleagues from the National Forum and indeed from students and staff across the Irish higher education sector over the course of two years. Um, and this guide uh, pertinent to Irish higher education uh, was um, defined enabling, enabling policies, outlined a five-step guide, um, and includes case studies and policy examples for people to draw from, uh, from both Irish and international um, higher education institutions. Um, importantly, it was published with a CC BY license, which meant that when um, a, a network of open educators um, saw this and, so, and thought that it could be the seeds of you know, a more global approach to supporting open policy, it was very easy to take this guide um, and adapt it and remix it and so on, which is what we have done to create the policy brief um, that's published today. So Javiera has already described how the definition of enabling policies um, consists of 15 criteria across three categories. This is just another view of that. Um, and this was drawn again from consultation with many students and staff across higher education and also a literature review, which looked at a lot of policy guidance. And a lot of it is combined together, you know, just a, a straight list of, of guidance for developing policies. And we thought it was important to disaggregate these areas of policy content, policy making process and policy form. Um, so they can be used almost as checklists or guidelines um, in different guises at different stages of the policy making process. So the content obviously should be um, integrated with institutional or organizational strategy. It should be reflective of organizational culture, it needs to be aligned with other uh, policies. The process should be, of course, collaborative, democratic. Uh, sh it should, um, at its heart, should be student staff partnership. Um, and it should be both diverse and intentionally equitable. So again, there's a lot more detail about all of these, um, the three categories and the 15 criteria in the policy brief. Um, again, Javier noted the five steps. This is another view of this five steps. And this view just points out that of course, there are sequential steps that are chronological in time that we start from, you know, uh, realizing the need for a policy to, you know, creating it and approving it and implementing it and reviewing it. But that step of creating it really embraces the notion of co-creation. And we explore this in great depth in the policy brief. So, and this is a cycle. So there's a lot of depth to that step, which is described um, in the guide. Um, it's a cycle of research, collaboration, review, revision, and we know from evidence, um, certainly here in Ireland and, and elsewhere, I know that, you know, speeding through the step, because it's easier to consult with just a few people instead of many people and, you know, diverse audiences, um, doesn't do you any favors later in the process, because although it might be easy to, to develop and get it on paper, um, there's lower chances of approval and certainly lower chances that the policy will be effective. Um, once it's implemented. So we're very committed to um, co-creation. In terms of learning from this whole process, both you know, our practice in Ireland and internationally, um, I often use this metaphor of um, you know, focusing on a leaf to a branch, to a tree, to you know, a whole ecosystem. And, and I think it's really reflective of the work that many of us do around open education um, in higher education and in other sectors. And that is that we, we you know, we want to support um, raising awareness about OER, you know, at the, at the individual person and student and, and, and educator level. Uh, we want to support people who are, you know, choosing a license, deciding where and how to share, um, rewarding practice, you know, for individuals, but also embedding in programs, in schools, in departments, um, and ultimately keeping an eye on the, the broader global and equitable goals of, of open education and not losing sight of that. So moving, you know, embracing this, this, you know, individual small efforts to group and systemic efforts is obviously challenging, but all are required. And certainly 
you know, the, the, OE, the UNESCO recommendation really points to that need. Challenges, there are many, of course, but we must be working towards systemic change. So it's, it's the reason we address policy and strategy and talk about changing culture. And systemic change is impossible without supportive policy. Um, so I'm so pleased, you know, that this, that this, that the policy brief is published today and that we can, you know, engage in more collaboration around what that means to develop supportive policy. When we are working at the level of policy and strategy, part of our work is connecting the opens. So, and again, this has been addressed already. Um, you know, a lot of that is really just communicating, you know, that the underlying values of open education, open science and scholarship, open data, you know, are derived from many of the same values. So there's kind of an education process. And if we want to kind of combine those efforts in the organizations within which we work. Um, again, realizing the broader values and benefits of openness. I think it's important never to miss an opportunity, even when helping someone to, you know, choose the appropriate open license for something to connect that work with the broader benefits um, of open education more broadly. And also, Although it's a challenge, I think it's important that we adopt the most expansive conceptualizations of open that we can. So the notion of OEP um, is really important, which incorporates and includes reusing, adapting, and sharing OER, as well as co-creation, equitable community engagement, and empowerment. And I'm, I'm honestly just so honored to be doing this work with you all, and just want to say thank you. Uh, my contact details are here, a link to the slides, and I I just end with a quote from Eddie Glaude, a US author, um, writing about um, racism and civil rights in the United States. And he has written recently just about the imperative of making bold choices in these challenging times, which is, that's the work we are, we are about here. So through collaboration on the policy brief and in all our efforts via UNESCO, um, I hope we find and sustain the courage um, to make bold choices. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cronin. Thank you for this uh, insightful presentation. Neil, you have the floor for the way forward. Thank you very much, Eleni, and uh, greetings, everyone. I realize that we are now very close to the end of the hour, so I'm not going to say much, but I thought it would be useful just to make a few observations um, which I hope will tie together what you've heard from previous presenters. As Catherine indicated in the introduction to, to her slides, we are at, at a very um, difficult time, I think, in human history where we, we've, uh, we're, we're really starting to see um, that growing global problems are creating uh, extended geopolitical instabilities. Um, and I think through the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen just how poorly prepared our education systems are in terms of resilience to respond to the kinds of imperatives for change that we see. Um, I, I would argue very strongly that the policies that we have that govern those systems are a very substantive part of the reason why we have such little resilience in those systems. Uh, and I think particularly what they illustrate is the growing inequalities that exist in access that are made worse uh, as soon as there's any kind of crisis. So there's plenty of documentation that shows us just how much uh, um, poorer people and marginalized people have suffered through campus closures um, and through various other responses that have come to these crises. Unfortunately, as we're hopefully emerging from the worst of the pandemic, we're moving into a new series of challenges. And I think these, these challenges are going to keep coming at us for some time. Um, on the plus side, obviously, challenges bring the opportunity for transformation. And I think what we have seen is, is that our education systems are characterized by highly rigid, overstructured, and out of date curricula, um, very heavy emphasis on summative assessments, um, very rigid, over elaborated policies that show little uh, resilience. And I think, again, COVID showed us just how dehumanizing uh, for educators so much of our policy environment is. So just reflecting on what, what Catherine spoke about and, and, and what previous speakers also mentioned, um, policies we should remember are nothing more than agreed, uh, codified agreements about how we decide to cooperate with each other in large scale systems. Um, so, so they're nothing more than agreements between human beings. They can just as easily be changed as not. Um, but what we've seen is that our policy environments are really not helping us to cope with the kind of, kinds of challenges we're facing. 
So, so as I've spent this time over the last two years reflecting on that, the one thing that's come through very clearly, and I think it's reflected in Javier's and, and, and Catherine's presentations, is that we now know for sure that just using open licenses is not really a proxy for any kind of meaningful openness in education. Um, that, that open licensing and the use of open educational resources can just as easily be deployed to entrench rigid and closed systems of education as it can to help to create more open learning. In other words, if we're just using open licenses and we're creating policies that facilitate the use of open licenses, but they create the kinds of educational systems and experiences that are opposite of the opposite of those that Catherine and, uh, and Javiera described, then it's actually taking us backwards, not forwards, because it's making those systems more efficient. And by definition, in my view, uh, it's dehumanizing both teachers and learners more. Um, so I think, uh, as Catherine's spoken about, really every policy decision we make now needs to be measured against its real transformative effects on education and education systems. Um, and so just, just to try and build on um, uh, what all three speakers have spoken about, and maybe to offer a couple of key points for, for reflection moving forward, um, I'm a great fan of simplicity. And um, one of the biggest concerns I have uh, uh, when I hear about discussions about policy development and how we create uh, po policies that support the OER recommendations implementation, um, I think one of the dangers is that we forget that they're being developed within a, a context. And that context already includes a lot of existing policies and regulations. Um, and so my plea to people, just using the kind of guide that, that Catherine provided us in, in the, the closing slides of her presentation, is that before we rush ahead with developing new policies, we should focus first on reviewing the existing policies and regulations that are already in place to assess the, to assess the extent to which they are supporting meaningful openness. And, and, and supporting the implementation of the OER recommendation, of course. Because if we create new policies on top of what already exists, we're likely only to create more complexity. And the more complexity we create, the less likely the hood there is of the kind of openness we've just heard spoken about today. So I think as we're doing that review, we, we've spoken so much about learner-centered education over the last two decades that I've been working, that I think we've almost sidelined and forgotten the well-being and empowerment of educators as fully functioning adults. And I think that what I've seen certainly in quality, if I look at quality assurance policies in higher education around the world, most of them seem to me to exist uh, in ways that suggest that educators are not to be trusted and are not fully functioning adults. And therefore we need quality assurance systems in place that continually micromanage and police everything they do. If we're serious about opening education we have to be serious about re-empowering educators as being critical to whatever kind of education we're delivering, whatever form of blended, digital, open, or face-to-face -face education we're talking about. So I think as a point of departure for thinking about how we might create real openness in our policies and reviewing what we have already, we should remember that no meaningful openness can be possible where policies dehumanize educators and treat them effectively like children who need to be policed. And unfortunately, I think there's quite strong evidence that over the last 15 to 20 years, central education policies have tended to move more in that direction and away from uh, the kind of openness and trust in educators that is important for real openness. Secondly, then, is to consider the possibility that policy change might include the removal and or radical simplification of existing policies. We shouldn't just be thinking in terms of adding new policies. Um, again, having had the opportunity to work in 50 or 60 countries around the world, I've seen over and over again that when we create new policies without thinking about how they interface with the existing policies, and particularly how we make sure that if we do develop new policies, that we actually decommission the old policies uh, with which they might come into conflict, um, or, or potentially where um, th th there might be contradictions, uh, we end up creating, again, so much complexity. Uh, I live in South Africa, which is, in, in my mind, the home of the most complicated policies in the world. And we're seeing the effects of it in education all the time. It just makes it harder and harder for people to do things. Apart from anything else, one of the key challenges is that it pro more policies proliferate, more administration. Uh, and, and in higher education, we're again seeing that academic administration is a consequence uh, 
of central bureaucracies and policies, uh, both from national and institutional levels, are actually robbing academics of more and more of their time, which they ought to be spending on doing teaching and learning or doing research, but instead are having to spend administering the policies under which they exist. So my plea to anyone who's engaged in policy change is to see policies as dynamic and, and fluid uh, processes, not as static documents. And to start by getting rid of policy, not just think about adding new policy. When I was listening carefully to what Catherine was describing in terms of open education policies, I saw so many ways in which the kind of philosophy that she was articulating could be just as well expressed by removing policies rather than by creating new ones. I think the enabling uh, of openness actually comes more effectively by reducing the number of rules we have and making sure that those rules are meaningful and can be adequately enforced um, rather than by adding new ones. So I think then just in, cl in closing and, and trying to, to pull together uh, what all three presenters spoke about, as you move forward, ensure the considerations of openness are reflected in the development of all new policies and regulations that affect education, not just ones that are specially purposely focused on these topics of open education practices and OERs and other related themes. Uh, all policies should be looked at through this lens, um, particularly those that are now being devised as part of the adaptation of education provision in response to COVID-19 uh, and what's followed on from that. A lot of the COVID-19 practices are now being entrenched in education systems and, and policies and practices. We have a really golden opportunity to achieve some of the aspirational goals that we've heard about today. But I think if we start with these just two critical things, let's get rid of policies, not just think about creating new ones. And let's make sure that every decision we're taking from a policy perspective is rehumanizing and empowering educators rather than dehumanizing them. And I think if we just to keep those two simple things in mind, um, we can go a long way to achieving the kinds of aspirational goals that we've heard about today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We uh, hope to see you again in our next webinar. Thank you very, very much. Be well. Bye, everyone.